Good morning, everyone, and welcome. There may still be a few stragglers coming in, folks maybe who went to the seminary and have to <laughs> make the pilgrimage over here, but we're going to go ahead and begin. It's great to have you all with us this morning for our third annual John Cardinal Glennon Lecture with Dr. Francis Beckwith. Uh, as we begin, I'm pleased that Bishop Rice, our auxiliary bishop, is with us, and I'd like to invite him to offer an opening prayer. Before I offer the prayer, just a word of thanks to you, Doctor, from Archbishop Carlson uh, for giving up your time to be with us this morning. And for the prayer, actually, I thought, uh, given the topic, um, I got a prayer from George Washington's own prayer book. Um, many of you might know he had a uh, very devout life, actually. Uh, he had certain prayers that he prayed on certain days of the week. And the prayer that I chose was the one that he would have prayed uh, on Monday mornings. Uh, it was, it's a prayer book. Uh, he didn't compose it, but he wrote it in his own hand, all his prayers and in his little book. So I thought that would be a nice way to uh, begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O eternal and everlasting God, we presume to present ourselves this morning before thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to accept our humble and hearty thanks. Direct our thoughts, words, and work wash away our sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb, and purge our hearts by thy Holy Spirit. Daily frame us more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, that living in thy fear and dying in thy favor, we may in thy appointed time attain the resurrection of the just unto eternal life. Bless our families, friends, and kindred, and unite us all in praising and glorifying thee in all of our works. Through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Thank you, Bishop. John Cardinal Glennon, for whom our lecture is named, was a native of Ireland who came as a missionary to St. Louis in 1884, and in 1903 he became the fourth Bishop, the third Archbishop of St. Louis. In addition to providing for the spiritual good of the Lord's flock in this archdiocese, he also contributed mightily to the temporal building up of the church. During his 40 plus years as Archbishop, he oversaw the building of our beautiful Cathedral Basilica. Uh, this building in which we gather today, which was the original Kenrick Seminary and is now the Cardinal Regali Center, and also the current seminary building which was the college named for him, Cardinal Glennon College, and now Kenrick Glennon Seminary. In 1946, Venerable Pope Pius XII created then Archbishop Glennon a cardinal, the first Archbishop of St. Louis to receive that honor. Cardinal Glennon College, which bears his name, is the priestly formation program for young men of college age who are working towards their bachelor's degrees in philosophy before beginning their graduate studies in theology. Currently, our college includes 34 seminarians from six different dioceses and archdioceses who are studying and being formed for the Holy Priesthood. Two years ago, in 2013, the faculty of Cardinal Glennon College established this annual lecture in philosophy to provide our seminarians and the wider public with the opportunity to learn from the wisdom of some of the most eminent philosophers in the United States. And it's been a very successful uh, young lecture series that we're pleased to continue this year. So I'd now like to invite forward Dr. John Gresham, who is Academic Dean at Kenrick Glennon Seminary, to introduce our 2015 John Cardinal Glennon Lecturer. Dr. Beckwith works at a fine university in a great state. Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I'm a proud graduate of that program. And Dr. Beckwith is professor of philosophy and church state studies at Baylor, where he also serves as associate director of the graduate program in philosophy and co-director of the program on philosophical studies of religion in Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. He's a graduate of Fordham University, both his master's and doctorate in philosophy. He also did a master of juridical studies 
here in St. Louis at Wash U. He's written numerous books, two of his forthcoming books, published by Cambridge University Press, is a book coming out titled Taking Rights Seriously, Law, Politics, and the Reasonableness of Faith. That second word, rights, is R-I-T-E-S, taking rights seriously, law, politics, and the reasonableness of faith. Another book forthcoming to be published by Ignatius Press is The Catholic Invitation to Mormonism. This is another area of his work is uh, dialogue, debate, uh, apologetics uh, with Mormons. And in our discussion last night, he mentioned that these Mormon publications would uh, review these works. They would disagree with him, but they would say he treats us with respect and takes our ideas seriously. So I, I think uh, Dr. Beckwith is a good model on how to do apologetics, how to engage others in a way that is respectful and uh, kind to them. He's also published a number of books in the area of Christian and philosophical engagement with politics. A book, uh, A Second Look at First Things, A Case for Conservative Politics. Politics for Christians, Statecraft as Soulcraft. And some works uh, on behalf of the cause of life, one of his works, Defending Life, a Moral and Legal Case Against Abortion Choice. One of his other notable books is entitled Return to Rome, Confessions of an Evangelical Catholic, in which he describes his uh, return to the faith of his baptism uh, from a background in evangelical Christianity. What makes his story particularly interesting is when he returned to the church, he was president of the Evangelical Theological Society. I was trying to think, what, what is that like to be the president of the Evangelical Theological Society and become a Catholic? And I thought, it'd be sort of like President Obama becoming a Republican. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's sort of, so it's a great story to read. He's published in numerous journals, I think over 30 different journals, and these are legal journals, philosophical journals, medical, ethical, philosophical, theological. Dr. Beckwith, I think, is such a, a model, an example of someone taking philosophy and faith and engaging the uh, issues of our age and of our society. And so we're very, I could speak at length about his many accomplishments and uh, honors, but uh, we're eager to hear him speak to us on the topic of faith, reason, and American public life. Please welcome Dr. Francis Beckwith. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, how was it to be president of the Evangelical Theological Society and become Catholic? I, I actually became Catholic or returned to the church a week before I resigned as ETS president. So technically for one week, the Evangelical Theological Society had a Catholic president. <laughs> I didn't have any ex-cathedra powers, so I couldn't, uh, couldn't accomplish anything theologically. Um, all I had to do was go to confession uh, because I had been baptized and confirmed Catholic. And I'll never forget that confession. I walked into the confessional. Uh, the priest uh, is a local Waco priest named Father, actually his, I don't know his real long name. We call him Father Raj. He's from East India. And I said, Father, it's been 30 years since my last confession. I don't think I can remember all my sins, and he says, that is okay, God knows them all. <laughs> I said, I was afraid of that. <laughs> he said, I said, he said, just give me gentle categories. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be the Glennon lecturer for this year. And this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, something that I've titled Faith, Reason, and American Public Life. 
A lot of what I'm going to say is really the focus of my forthcoming book that had, was mentioned earlier, Taking Right Seriously. I want to say a few things about that book and, and so that you have a better understanding of what I'm trying to do this morning in this lecture. Uh, I come to politics and law from philosophy. That is, I, when I was in Fordham University studying for my doctorate, the area of my interest were metaphysics, philosophy of religion, and in fact did my doctoral dissertation on David Hume's argument against miracles, which has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. Later on, when I began teaching at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, I began teaching courses in moral and political philosophy and legal philosophy, and something that I began to recognize in the legal and political literature, especially on issues that overlapped theology, or more specifically, on issues that in American public life that divided people along largely theological lines. That mo in many cases, people that were writing in the legal literature and even, believe it or not, judges and justices didn't seem to understand the deeper issues that were behind some of these debates. And what I mean by that is they would often depict and present theological beliefs as if they had no epistemic import whatsoever. What I mean by epistemic import, for those who are studying philosophy, you know what I mean by epistemology or epistemic import. And what I mean is that theological beliefs carry with them no rational weight whatsoever. And so what I want to talk about this morning is a couple, couple, of, couple of things. First, I want to go over some uh, court cases very briefly uh, that present theological beliefs as if they have no rational import, and then tell you a little bit about what's going on in the legal literature today that I think uh, as Catholics and Christians we should be very concerned about and have answers for. Uh, I want to open up with a, a quote here from Jeremy Waldron. So all of you should have a copy of, of, of notes um, that were distributed when you walked in. And if you didn't, I, I don't know where, where they would get them. Um, uh, you should all, all, all have them. Uh, Jeremy Waldron, if you don't know, is a professor of law at NYU. He's also a philosopher. This is from a quote from a book that he uh, published about 13 years ago called God, Locke, and Equality, Christian Foundations of John Locke's Political Thought. And this is what Waldron says. Secular theorists often assume that they know what a religi religious argument is like. They present it as a crude prescription from God, backed up with threat of hellfire derived from general or particular revelation, and they contrast it with the elegant complexity of a philosophical argument uh, by Rawls, that is John Rawls, or Ronald Dworkin. Uh, with this image in mind, they think it obvious that religious argument should be excluded from public life. But those who have bothered to make themselves familiar with existing religious-based arguments in modern political theory know that this is mostly a travesty, unquote. And what I want to, the argument I want to make this morning, or the, the point of view that I want to present this morning, is going to confirm what Waldron has said here, that what you find in the legal literature and among the judges and the justices is a not only a misunderstanding of the nature of theological beliefs and how, why people believe them, but just, I think, a misunderstanding of, of religious belief in general. Uh, let me get, tell you a, a story. Um, a couple of years ago, this, this was one of those, I don't know if you've ever had this happen in your life. You, you, an event occurs in which you are present and everything crystallizes at once. And so you don't need an explanation anymore. You just have to tell that story. So I'm going to tell that story to you. Uh, 13 years ago, now, or 11 years ago now, I was speaking at Texas Tech University in Lubbock. And if you've ever been to Lubbock, it's like the moon in terms of the geography. Um, it, what? <laughs> Uh, I was at Texas Tech University and was giving a, a lecture. I was invited to speak on the topic of law, Darwinism, and public education. And it actually was based on a, my dissertation uh, that I had written uh, while at Washington University School of Law. 
Uh, I was invited by the Christian Legal Society as well as the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy uh, to, to talk on this. And it was at that time of, and still a very controversial subject, but more so in 2004 because Texas um, was dealing with uh, debates about their science textbooks. And so uh, what happened, I, I gave this lecture, pretty much talked about the legal issues, uh, didn't really deal with the scientific or the philosophical issues uh, concerning, at that time, the teaching of intelligent design in public schools. Uh, my own view on this is that it's, it should be, it's permissible, I think, constitutionally to teach it, but I'm convinced that intelligent design as a view is flawed for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly theological reasons. I think that the view has a diminished understanding of divine action, but that's a, another topic for another, or another issue for another lecture. In any event, when I was done speaking, one of the uh, audience members who had later introduced himself to me as a professor, uh, one of the professors in the hard sciences, uh, raised, he raised his hand and he said, uh, Professor Beckwith, all, all you said was very interesting, but all you've given us are religious arguments. Uh, I paused for a moment and looked at him and said, wow, I'm relieved. I thought you were going to say they were bad arguments. Now, that moment, that, in that moment, something crystallized in my mind that had never really occurred to me, that the way in which people talk about theological and religious questions, they assume that if you can take somebody's point of view and put the adjective religious in front of it, that in itself means it is no longer a respectable opinion that we can entertain and discuss and offer arguments for. And that seems to be the dominant view uh, in the courts as well as uh, among some of the legal scholars I'll be talking about in a few minutes. What you find oftentimes is this, um, this suggestion that by, by doing that, what, what, the, what the individual is often doing is trying to take an issue over which people may have different points of view and saying it's really about two different subjects. Let me give you uh, an example of, uh, of how this is done, and then I'll, we'll get into some of the court cases and legal scholars. Oh, this is about maybe 15, maybe 12 years ago, um, President Bush, the, 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 the second President Bush, not the, not the first President Bush, uh, the second President Bush who was, six, who was uh, uh, president from 2001 to 2009, soon after he became president, uh, he had to de deal with the issue of embryonic stem cell research, whether the federal government should fund embryonic stem cell research. And he gave a speech uh, in August where he uh, told, it was actually a nationally televised speech. He t we don't remember it because it was two weeks before 9-11. Uh, but he gave the speech explaining why his administration was not going to um, fund it or, or support funding it, and um, it was a uh, it was a speech, though, that drew a lot of attention by legal scholars. Uh, one legal scholar in particular, particular a professor at, um, at, at that time, she t I think she taught at Rutgers, but uh, now teaches at Cornell University, uh, she wrote a piece for uh, one of the online legal magazines, and she made the argument that, uh, that what President Bush was doing in this case was simply trying to foist his religious views on other people. And that from a secular point of view, all that uh, those that were defending embryonic stem cell research were doing was simply offering to people an opportunity, or, or to scientists at least, an opportunity to discover cures for diseases that would ultimately benefit people. And that the issues that were really behind President Bush's uh, position were issues having to do with uh, the existence of the soul, uh, when the soul comes into being, when the fetus receives a soul, and so forth. And these are obviously theological, not scientific questions. What she did in that essay was to, was to take an, a question, and the question is this. Who and who is not a member of the human community, and does it include embryos? And turn it into two different subjects, 
theology and science. And by doing that, what she was suggesting was this. What President Bush and those that agree with him were actually suggesting was something having to do with faith. What I am suggesting has to do with reason. And they're two separate subjects entirely. This is a danger that I think that we can fall into, and I think we may have fallen into, and I'll speak about this uh, towards the end of the lecture, I think in the Hobby Lobby case, which was recently decided by the Supreme Court. I was present at a uh, discussion group, oh, in summer of 2013, there were several of us that had been invited to talk about strategy for the Hobby Lobby case. And uh, among us were several attorneys working for Hobby Lobby and like-minded or uh, other organizations and groups that were uh, responding to the, uh, the mandate by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of the strategy had to do with appealing to the fact that this was a matter of religious liberty. And I didn't disagree with that. I thought that that was an important, obviously, it, when you're arguing before a court and you're appealing to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, you have to make an argument that your religious beliefs uh, were being compromised or you were being forced to act in ways inconsistent with what you believe is true. But one of, the, one of the mistakes in that strategy, I think, in terms of public perception is because most people, when, they, when you say that this is my religious belief, in their minds, they reinterpret it to mean something like this. Uh, my, let's say that you believe, as, as a Catholic, that the use of contraception is gravely immoral. In their, a lot of people's minds, that means that your belief in, uh, about the nature of contraception or the nature of, of, of prenatal life is something like your belief in the Trinity or your belief in transubstantiation, rather than something that could be argued for based on the deliverances of reason. And so when we make the argument in the public square uh, concerning, let's say, an issue like this, we have to remember that when we say that a belief is religious, to a lot of people that means that our belief is not under the purview of rational discourse and therefore can't be the sort of thing that we can claim uh, uh, exceptions to, right? So, in other words, think of it this way. Um, when the Secretary of Health and Human Services puts under uh, the HHS mandate a requirement that all businesses provide certain drugs and pharmaceuticals that in fact result in early abortions, uh, she does it under what? Health. Health is connected to medicine. Medicine is a science. Science is the highest and most important deliverance of reason. But when you say, I object to that based on the fact this is my theological belief, a theological belief is what? Tethered to religion, and religion is based on faith. And so in the minds of those in the public square, it's a debate between faith and reason. And guess who always wins in that? <laughs> reason. And so I do think one of the things we have to be careful about as Christians and Catholics in the public square is to make distinctions between those things that we believe that we, we, we think we can defend based on rational argument, those things that are deliverances of special revelation, and those things that are in some ways combinations of both. Uh, but we often confuse those two, and I think partly because of the way in which religion is thought of in the public square. So let's, um, let me uh, move to some of the, uh, very briefly go over some of the comments uh, that are found in, in some of the court cases, and then uh, move on to what's going on in the legal literature. Now, the court cases, I'm going to be very brief here. In fact, um, uh, I will... Uh, here recommend uh, a, a, a two-part, uh, uh, two, uh, a set of two books uh, published uh, uh, by Professor James Hitchcock, a uh, historian at, uh, at uh, St. Louis University, who I understand teaches here every once in a while, who I understand is in the audience uh, right now. Uh, Professor Hitchcock published uh, two books on uh, church and state by Princeton University Press that I actually reviewed 
11 years ago for the Journal of Church and State. And one of the points that he makes in the book is if you go through at least contemporary Supreme Court cases roughly from the 1940s to the present, one of the things you discover about religion generally, most of the justices seem to assume that religion is irrational, dangerous, uh, sectarian, and private. And one of the assumptions behind that is that religion is fundamentally irrational, or at least sub-rational. So it may be something like a private uh, interest you have, a hobby, but it's really not something that should have any influence on um, your public life. Um, some of the, the cases uh, that I want to just briefly mention, um, there's a, a case called United States versus Ballard. It's, it's, a, it's a case involving, um, uh, uh, well, it's, I don't want to get into the details of it. Uh, we, it's an interesting case about uh, a person uh, that claimed that Jesus told somebody, told them to, to tell other, or uh, Jesus told them to give money to them, and it turned out the person really didn't believe it. That they So the question is, was it really fraud if you, uh, uh, does it count as fraud? In other words, what if the person really did believe it? Would it really be fraud? Right? So there's interesting questions about whether the court should delve into questions about the truth of religious beliefs when it comes to issues concerning fraud and, and so forth. And William O. Douglas, in a, in a famous uh, portion of the opinion, uh, says, men may believe what they cannot prove. They may not be, uh, be put to the proof of their religious doctrines or beliefs. Religious experiences, which are as real as life to some, may be incomprehensible to others. Yet this fact, yet the fact that they may be beyond the ken of mortals does not mean that they can be, may, may, may be, excuse me, can be made suspect before the law. Uh, many take their gospel from the New Testament, but it would hardly be supposed that they could be tried before a jury charged with the duty of determining whether those teachings contain false representations. The miracles of the New Testament, the divinity of Christ, life after death, the power of prayer are deep in the religious convictions of many. If one could be sent to jail because a jury in a hostile environment found those teachings false, little indeed would be left of religious freedom. And there, there's actually a little, there's a kernel of truth here, right? We, we don't want, for example, juries making judgments about the veracity of certain religious beliefs uh, in, in cases such as this. On the other hand, though, behind Douglas's thinking is, is a deeper claim that in principle, these sorts of beliefs could never be uh, supported by rational argument or even uh, have any sort of cognitive content whatsoever. Uh, in another opinion, uh, uh, Justice Brennan um, says that, quote, it is the essence uh, of religious faith that ecclesiastical decisions are to be reached and are to be accepted as matters of faith, whether or not rational or measurable of objective criteria. He further argues, quote, constitutional concepts of due process involving secular notions of fundamental fairness are therefore hardly relevant to such matters of ecclesial uh, ecclesiastical cognizance. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, I, I found that quote to be stunning given the fact that if you read uh, the first, at least Leviticus and Deuteronomy, it is full of things about due process. And, and I mean, it's sort of remarkable that a justice could actually say something like this, unaware of some, a, a, something like uh, what you find, for example, in the Pentateuch, not to mention canon law, right? And yet this is, you know, said in an opinion. Um, relying on the insights of the great jurist Clarence Darrow, uh, Justice Paul Stevens, uh, John Paul Stevens writes in a concurring opinion in, in Woolman versus Walter, that the distinction between the religious and the secular is a fundamental one. To quote from Darrow's argument in the Scopes case, the realm of religion is where knowledge leaves off and where faith begins, and it never has needed the arm of the state for support and wherever it has received it, it has harmed both the public and the religion that it would pretend to serve. Uh, in another a dissenting opinion in Webster versus Reproductive Health Services, uh, Justice Stevens uh, dealing with a Missouri uh, statute that uh, limited abortion, but in its uh, preamble talked about life beginning at conception. And uh, there Stevens 
says that this is this has no it's, it's a, it, this has no secular purpose. In fact, this is what he says: as a ma as a secular matter, there is an obvious difference between the state interest in protecting the freshly fertilized egg and the state interest in protecting nine-month gestated fully sentient fetus on the eve of birth. There can be no interest in protecting the newly fertilized egg from physical pain or mental anguish because the capacity for, su for such suffering does not yet exist. Respecting a developed fetus, however, that interest is valid. His point here, he's, he seems to be saying that uh, the belief that somehow an embryo has intrinsic value can't be confirmed or substantiated by some quantifiable measurement like the ability to feel pain, which he somehow links to a secular reason, not realizing that one could in fact argue that an embryo is intrinsically valuable without appealing to theology and at the same time acknowledging it that it cannot feel pain. The assumption is what? That the only type of secular reason that counts is a consequentialist understanding of reason in the measurability of pleasure and pain which is itself one of many different secular ways of looking at moral judgment, right? So what you find here, uh, at least in Stevens's dissent, is a kind of what? Smuggled in view of secular reason, saying that anything that doesn't fit this measurable, uh, quantifiable criteria is itself not only, it's gotta be theological. Uh, so, so you find this not, in, in other opinions as well, but, but this is a, a, an example. In fact, for those who are studying uh, philosophy and logic in particular, one of the things that, that's, that may have occurred to you when I read Stevens's comments is that, uh, that he begs the question, that he assumes that the only way in which we can measure moral value is by whether a being feels pleasure or pain. That, that doesn't seem obvious. There's lots of cases where it seems wrong to harm somebody or a person can be harmed even if they don't feel pain or can't feel pleasure. Uh, in the famous, uh, one of the famous, uh, one of the several famous, but the first famous uh, school prayer case, uh, Justice Hugo Black um, writes, um, the Establishment Clause thus stands an as an expression of principle on the part of the founders of our Constitution that religion is too personal, too sacred, too holy to permit its unhallowed perversion for a, by a civil magistrate. Uh, picking up on this 35 years later in Lee v. Weissman, Justice Kennedy reinforces Black's understanding of religion when he writes, quote, the design of the Constitution is that preservation and transmission of religious beliefs and worship is a responsibility and a choice committed to the private sphere, which itself has promised freedom to pursue that mission. This understanding that religion is not something that uh, goes beyond the individual in his private life and it's no different than, let's say, a matter of taste or opinion that can't be established by rational argument. Justice Scalia, in a kind of uh, riry, um, we would say snarky response, says uh, in re reply to Justice Kennedy, church and state would not be such a difficult subject if religion were, as the court apparently thinks it to be, some personal private avocation that can be indulged in entirely in secret, like pornography in the privacy of one's room. For most believers, that is not, it is not that and has never been that." Unquote. The common thread in these opinions, and there are many, many others, in fact, Professor Hitchcock's book has numerous other opinions uh, of a similar type in which the justices say very similar things about the nature of religion. But the, the, the common thread, in, in, of course, Justice Scalia's uh, opinion accepted, is that religious beliefs and their attendant notions, such as moral and metaphysical beliefs, are epistemically akin to self-regarding private and personal matters of taste, and thus not proper subjects of rational assessment. This is not to say, as I said, that there are not justices like Scalia who disagree with that understanding. Rather, what I'm suggesting is that the general tenor of the court's opinions that touch on the epistemic nature of religious beliefs and their attendant notion, notions is that these beliefs are not amenable to reason. Now, there is a sense in which the justices um, are not entirely wrong, that there's a sense in which, um, at least in, a, in, a, in, a, in the American understanding of church-state jurisprudence, when it comes to um, uh, 
in individuals' private beliefs, we do have a kind of ultima facie right not to be coerced from the government to change our beliefs. But in terms of contemporary jurisprudence, that's not where the action is. The action is uh, on issues in which you have citizens, let's say, who hold a particular view of the nature of human life, the nature of marriage, and the nature of the public good, that they believe should be reflected in our laws. That's where the action is, and this is why it's really important to understand this way of thinking. Uh, that is, if, if in fact you had, let's say, a concession that what religious citizens are offering are, are, are points of view that are reasonable but we may disagree with them, that would be one thing. But you, what you have in the, these opinions isn't so much that. What you have is this understanding that they are not simply alternative accounts that rival so-called secular accounts but they are not even really accounts. <laughs> they are somehow beneath uh, rational discourse. Now, there is a school of thought uh, in, in, in American jurisprudence that doesn't want to go that far, and it's usually associated with the philosopher J John Rawls that says that, yes, religious citizens can be reasonable, but they don't have a right. In fact, non-religious citizens are equally uh, proscribed in this regard, that nobody can use the state to coerce other citizens to act in ways uh, that they are rational in rejecting. And so you have some uh, uh, philosophers like Rawls who argue, no, religious citizens aren't irrational. They're rational, but their arguments are not so strong that other people should be required to believe them, and we're going to apply the same standards to secular citizens as well. That point of view is not what I'm critiquing here. What I'm critiquing is a stronger point of view, which is actually in ascendancy today, uh, at least in the legal academy. 20 years it wasn't. 20 years the dominant understanding was Rawls's view. Now the dominant, or at least the uh, understanding that's in ascendancy, is the view not that religious citizens hold reasonable views that they can't force others to uh, practice. It's that their views aren't even reasonable. In fact, there's two kind of uh, schools of, of points of view that are in ascendancy of the academy today when it comes to religion and the law. One is that one, that religious beliefs are not really rational. And the other view is that religious is, religion is not special. That is, that religious beliefs come under a general heading of a kind of right to personal autonomy. Let me give you an example of the second, and then I'm going to move back to the, the question of, of reason and, and religion. Uh, early, early last year, March of 2014, I, I was giving a talk at the University of Miami School of Law. And um, it was actually on Ash Wednesday. That's how I remember because I had to get ashes, and they went to Little Havana. And I got ashes, and I had a couple of shots of Cuban coffee. And I don't think I slept for two days. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I, was, I, I gave a talk on religion and, 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 and the law and talking a little bit about some of the issues that we're discussing uh, this morning. And there, there was a professor uh, that they had brought in to comment on my, on my talk. And during the question and answer period, uh, a member of the audience asked this question to both of us involving uh, a case in Florida of a Muslim, uh, several Muslim women that wanted they did not want to remove their, their veil uh, that was covering their face uh, for the photograph for their driver's license. And so I, I and, and they asked me, the student asked me what I thought about that, and I told her that if there was a way for the government to accommodate that citizen, that they should have, they should accommodate that citizen. They should allow her uh, to not have to have, to, to, you know, to take, to not have her fa face photographed, if, if it could be done you know, and I, I'm, and, but my, my, my colleague, uh, the professor at University of Miami, she said, oh, I've got a better solution to this. Um, I think that they could, uh, they, they don't have to have their, their, their face photographed under a general right to wardrobe. Now, you see, that, what that, what, that was a move that she made that was consistent with this new trend in the academy, that, that religious belief is, is not really, there's nothing distinct about religious belief. It's just another set of opinions about reality. And, and there's some truth to that. 
but it's, it, 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 it could be subsumed under any sort of other personal interest or avocation that, a, that an individual may have. So I, I responded to her, I said, you don't understand. For these women who are putting, who don't want to remove their face covering, it's because they think Allah told them. It's not a choice between Saks Fifth Avenue and The Gap. It, 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 so I said, in a way, what you're doing, and this is what I told her, you're diminishing the, the, the role of conscience in the lives of these women. It's not a matter, they aren't making a choice to believe this. They believe it. You know, it's like most of our, most of our beliefs are like that. Did you ever try to unbelieve something? It's impossible, right? I mean, I'm being appeared to audiencely right now. I can try to unbelieve it, but it'd be very difficult, right? So for most religious believers, most of our beliefs are not things that we necessarily choose, right? It's not like, I mean, we, we sometimes find ourselves believing things, right? Or we do, in some cases, we, we, there may actually be some beliefs we have that we're not sure about, but we believe them because of the authority of the church. Or there may be things that we believe so strongly that we just can't, Imagine unbelieving them, right? Uh, so, but, but that way of thinking about religious beliefs has been lost on a lot of secular theorists. They want to turn religious belief into a commodity or a choice. So you also find another trend, at least in, among the justices, to treat religion as if it's something somebody chooses. And the reality is, is that we don't really, I mean, in a sense we do, there are conversions, but even in cases of conversions, people don't all of a sudden get up one morning and say, you know, I had Buddhism yesterday. I think tomorrow I'm going to try Anglicanism. You know, it's just, it's not like that, right? We do change our minds concerning our theological beliefs, but it's usually slowly over time, the result of appropriating different beliefs, kind of uh, accommodating them. I mean, there's more of a noetic structure of our beliefs, not a sequence of choices we make, right? So that trend is also in the academy. But I want to focus now on this, this other one, and that is that religion is somehow sub-rational. And I want to briefly just mention three legal theorists here and cite from their works. There are others, but these three uh, have gotten a lot of play in the literature. Uh, the first is Stephen, Stephen Gay, who actually has, has passed away. Uh, he was a Florida State uh, professor. And um, in uh, several articles, including one that he had published in West Virginia Law Review called Life After the Establishment Clause, uh, he says uh, that, um, quote, in a proper democracy, religion should be primarily a private phenomenon because religion and politics are simply incompatible. It is no longer possible in the modern world to decide collectively matters that are by their nature non-rational metaphysical and impervious to both empirical analysis and logical proof or disproof. Now for those, again, for, for those students here who have studied or are studying philosophy, when, I, when you read that, you probably thought, well, wait a second, metaphysics is rational, <laughs> right? Or, or wait, one of, the, one of the problems, and this is why I, I, I want to encourage those here who are either professors or who have who are students who may in, some, in the future want to be a professor, that there's a lot of work to be done in the legal literature by people who know the theological and religious literature so that they could educate those like Professor Gay. So you have these comments like this, and anybody who's familiar with what goes on in, let's say, philosophy of religion or metaphysics or some of the other uh, uh, disciplines within philosophy that overlap religion and theology, you think, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that, that's precisely correct. He doesn't. There's just no real under... So he lumps here anything uh, having to do with metaphysics is somehow non-rational. He equates rationality with the deliverances of the hard sciences. And yet you would think to yourself, well, wait a second. The claim that, that rationality is equivalent to the deliverances of the hard sciences, it is not itself a deliverance of the hard science. So that can't be rational. Right? So, I mean, there's all these sorts of things that immediately occur to you if you even study this. And this is one of the reasons why I have been drawn to writing in this area, because of the fact that there just is not very much written uh, by Catholic and Christian uh, philosophers and theologians who also know the law. Susanna Sherry, 
who's at uh, University of Minnesota. She writes, while it may be possible to envision a religion based wholly or partly uh, on reason, most of the major religions in America are based on faith as the underlying epistemology. For the faithful, the ultimate authority and source of truth is extra human and evidence can, and in some religious traditions, uh, must be entirely personal to the individual. For the reasonable, and what she means by the reasonable is those that follow reason, both the source and evidence for the truth lie in common human observation, experience, and reasoning. Uh, she also says, and this is not in your notes, but it's worth quoting, um, she says, secular science and liberal politics, both committed to the primacy of reason, necessarily deny that any truth is incontestable. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but this is something that's also uh, mentioned in, in different words by our next author, uh, Professor Brian Leiter uh, from the University of Chicago, who is quite more, a lot more sophisticated than, uh, than Sherry or Gay, but I think uh, equally mistaken. He writes, quote, it, for all religions, uh, there are at least some beliefs central to the religion that, quote, that first, issue in categorical demands of action, that is, demands that must be satisfied no matter what an individual's antecedent desires and no matter what incentives or disincentives the world offers up. What he's simply saying here is that, that people, religious citizens will in fact do the right thing even if it means they'll be persecuted. Right? And that's, we, we agree with that. Uh, secondly, uh, some beliefs central to the religion that do not answer ultimately or at the limit to evidence and reasons as these are understood in other domains concerned with knowledge of the world um, religious beliefs in virtue of being based on faith are insulated from ordinary standards of evidence and rational justification, the ones we employ in both common sense and in the sciences. Now there's a common thread in, 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 in this view which I call secular rationalism and the common thread is this. Religious beliefs are irrational because they are based on one, unprovable claims in the sense that they are the sorts of beliefs that cannot in principle be proven. Two, incontestable claims in the sense that they are the sorts of beliefs that cannot in principle be falsified, and three, claims that cannot change or develop because they are insulated from the ordinary standards of evidence and rational justification. So they can't be proven, uh, or they're, they're, uh, they, they, they're unprovable, they're incontestable, and they're insulated from contrary points of view. Um, all, I think all, I think this is mistaken on a variety of levels, and I want to go over s several ways to think about these claims. Um, first, um, I want to, uh, by title of this section, don't know much about theology or perhaps philosophy as well. Uh, first thing, and this is really basic intro to philosophy stuff, but it's still worth bringing up because it shows uh, the problem, I think the fundamental epistemological problem with this approach to religious belief. So, um, what is the assumption uh, behind um, this secular rationalism? It, the, the assumption is, is something called uh, narrow foundationalism. What's narrow foundationalism? Well, it's a school of thought in epistemology that says that in order for you to hold a belief and to be rational holding that belief, it has to be either in the foundations of knowledge. What's the foundations of knowledge? Uh, things that are self-evidently true, those things that are evident to the senses, and those beliefs that are incorrigible. What are incorrigible beliefs? Well, things like I'm being, peer, uh, I'm being appeared to by an audience, right? I can't not believe it, right? It may be false, there may not be an audience there, but it's incorrigibly true that I see an audience, right? So in order for a belief to be rational, it has to be one of those it has to be part of that foundation or something inferred from those, that foundation. So uh, my beliefs, let's say uh, uh, scientific discoveries, uh, the laws of logic, those are all derived from the foundations. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with narrow foundationalism? Well, a lot of, there's been a lot of literature on this and I'm just going to briefly mention some of the problems with that particular point of view. Let's look, at, let's look at some propositions here that I have uh, written down. Uh, I have A through G. Reason necessarily denies incontestable truths. That's the claim that Susanna Sherry made. And uh, Leiter, to a certain extent, is making the same claim. 
Well, first off, the question we can raise is, is the claim that reason necessarily denies incontestable truths an incontestable truth? Now, think about it. Well, in order for it to be rational, it would have to not be an incontestable truth. And yet, it's being used, what? As a fundamental basis for knowing everything else, which would mean it ha would have to be, what? Well, an incontestable truth. <laughs> so it's self-refuting. What's a self-refuting claim? Well, if I say something like, don't believe anything I say. Right? Think about it, right? Or if I had a shirt on that said the statement on the back of this shirt is false and the back of the shirt said the statement on the front of this shirt is true. Right? So, uh, so <laughs> self-refutation indicates that, a, that the claim is just simply false on its face. Right? So there, there seems to have to be, at some point, fundamental beliefs that people hold that are not the deliverance of either empirical knowledge or that are self-evident or incorrigible. Right? Let me give you some others, uh, some necessary truths. All bachelors are unmarried males. Two plus two equals four. Circumference equals two pi radius. These are necessary truths that seem to be true that aren't necessarily the deliverances of the empirical sciences. In fact, one could argue that the empirical sciences depend on those beliefs, right? Now, the narrow foundationalist does believe that ne there are such things as mathematical truths that are necessarily true. But here, I'm bringing up necessary truths in order to really respond to the person that doesn't even include those, the person like Susanna Sherry and, and Leiter that simply say, it's the hard sciences that is our model. Right? And it turns out the hard sciences themselves not only depend on necessary truths like these that are not empirically discovered but are presupposed, but a whole other set of sets of beliefs uh, that are not that, that science can't even, get, can't even get out the ground without them. So, for example, that our uh, that our theories have to be simple, right? Or we accept the the more simple theory or the one that has the least number of ad hoc hypotheses in comparison to another theory, or uh, that our rational faculties work, or that our theories do fit reality. These are beliefs that we have to actually have before we even look at the world, and we don't actually confirm them by scientific theories. Our scientific theories don't even work unless we believe them already, right? What about these? Uh, it is morally wrong everywhere and always to torture children for fun. Now, that's not really a necessary truth, but it seems to be a truth that I am more certain of, or people are more certain of, than they are of E equals MC squared. I mean, I could easily imagine Einstein's special theory of relativity being refuted, but I find it almost impossible to imagine that I could ever be wrong, that it is morally wrong everywhere and always to torture children for fun. So it turns out that certain moral beliefs that are not the result of the hard sciences, we actually are more sure of. Some others. Uh, the proper end of the human mind is the acquisition of wisdom. Human persons are beings of immeasurable worth and dignity. These are beliefs that we hold that seem to be true, and they're not really the deliverances of the hard sciences, and they're really not part of our epistemic foundation. They're, in the words of Alvin Plantinga, the great reformed philosopher, they're properly basic beliefs that we know are true. Now, as Catholics, we would say, well, the reason why people come to believe these things is they have a, a kind of primitive awareness of the natural moral law, right? And so when we point these things out, what we're doing is drawing that out, and we're making them more aware of what they already know, or as what my colleague at University of Texas, uh, Jay Budzieszewski, says, what we can't not know, right? So let's move on now to another part of a critique. Um, Time is actually moving more quickly than I had. Um, uh, I always over-prepare for these things. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, and some of you who are professors probably uh, know what I'm talking about. Um, so let me move on to um, uh, another part of, of a critique of, of this of secular rationalism, and that is that it, it, it begs substantive questions. To beg the question is to assume what you're trying to prove. And I just want to briefly go over how each, uh, in terms of the three-part criteria or three parts of um, secular rationalism beg 
substantive questions. First, the question of unprovable. Uh, that's the first part of the, uh, of the first uh, claim in, in secular rationalism. A couple of things that sort of stand out with these authors, um, and this is not only true of, of Leiter, Sherry, and, and Gay, but so many other authors that write on religion and the legal literature, they, have, they don't seem to, be, to really care or be aware of the fact that over the past 50 to 60 years, there's been a real renaissance in the philosophy of religion uh, that has occurred across Christian denominations. Um, in the past 50, 60 years or so, the number of books, articles published by prestigious presses, prestigious journals, by Christian and, and, and some non-Christian philosophers defending theistic belief is truly extraordinary. And when you read the legal scholars, when they discuss religion, it's, it's as almost as if they, have ne they don't even know it exists. And, and in some cases, they don't now. Now, Leiter does uh, acknowledge the existence of this literature, but he simply dismisses it. He says, well, the only people that really believe this stuff are religious people anyway, so I'm going to ignore it. I, I find that to be astonishing. I mean, imagine if I were reading, or any one of us was reading an art, a book by a well-known materialist philosopher like Richard Dawkins, and I were to say in a public lecture at a secular university, you know what, I don't, I don't really read materialists because the only people that, you know, really believe this or write, defend it are people that believe it. Well, of course, I mean, what, what, you know, it's like the, the, the old, I remember when I was in, an undergrad, one of my professors said, well, you know, the only, you know, the only real testimony we have of the risen Christ are the apostles who believed it. <laughs> well, that would have been something if, if they had seen the risen Christ and not believed it. I mean, that, sort of, that would have been actually itself a kind of miracle, right? I mean, uh, just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual way to, re to reason, and it's a, um, it, it, it's something that I think is, uh, is, a, is deeply flawed in Leiter's work. He just simply dismisses it. And uh, in my forthcoming book, Taking Right Seriously, I actually have an entire chapter on his work on this. And it uh, is, a, again, it's kind of astonishing. Uh, the other point that I want to make is that, is that when we talk about religious beliefs being proven or disproven, uh, I, I think that's a, a kind of a crude way to talk about how we may in, in some cases, show the rationality of our beliefs. They, they aren't, our beliefs aren't, in many cases, simply like scientific hypotheses. Um, it, it's, it's what my, what uh, one of my friends uh, calls the beer in the refrigerator fallacy. Like if somebody asked you the question, is there beer in the refrigerator, you go look, right? So it's an empirical question, but if somebody says, is God good, you don't look, right? You engage in kind of a philosophical reasoning in order to show that God is good. That is, that is a different way of thinking. So let me give you one illustration how I, I, I do this in, in, in taking right seriously. I have a chapter on the, the, relation, the issues concerning science and theology, and I deal with uh, the work of Richard Dawkins, his, uh, his book, um, uh, The God Delusion, which is actually quite painful to read. I think I actually took off about 10,000 years in purgatory uh, as a consequence of, uh, I may have just lost it now for telling you. So, um, uh, but in the book, he, he mentions, um, you know, as you know, uh, Dawkins is famous for, uh, for many things, for being an atheist, but one of the points that he makes in his book uh, is, that, um, uh, is that there's no such thing as intrinsic purpose or design in nature. And, uh, you know, he goes after uh, the, the, those that advocate intelligent design. And, and I actually, I'm critical of the intelligent design advocates as well in, in my book, Taking Rights Seriously. But one of the points I want to make is that there's other types of purpose in nature uh, that, 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 that is different from, let's say, what the intelligent design advocates are arguing for. And that type of design in nature is not detected by scientific methods. It actually is a combination of, of philosophical reasoning derive from uh, our observation of nature. Uh, and, and I give an example how Dawkins actually does it himself and doesn't realize it. Uh, in his book, The God Delu Delusion, he laments the career path of a gentleman named Kurt Wise. Uh, Kurt um, uh, was a, um, a doctoral, actually did his undergraduate at University of Chicago in geology and then uh, did his PhD under Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard 
in paleontology. He arrived at Harvard as a young earth creationist. For those who know much about the evangelical Protestant world, the young earth creationist is someone who takes the, the, the book of Genesis, at least the first 10 chapters, literally, and believes the earth is less than 10,000 years old. So he leaves, he arrived there as a young earth creationist and left that way, and as you can imagine, he could never secure an appointment at a major research university. So he wind up teaching at a very small college in Tennessee called Bryan College, which is named after, of all people, William Jennings Bryan, who was one of the prosecuting attorneys in the Scopes trial. Uh, so uh, in, in um, The God Delusion, this is what Dawkins says about Wise's career move. He says, I find that terribly sad The Kurt Wise story is just plain pathetic, pathetic and contemptible. The wound to his career and his life's happiness was self-inflicted, so unnecessary, so easy to escape. I am hostile to religion because of what it did to Kurt Wise, and if it did it to a Harvard-educated geologist, just think what it can do to others less gifted and less well-armed. Now, it goes without saying that many of us, in fact, perhaps all of us in this room would, would agree with Dawkins uh, that, that, that there's a kind of false dilemma here, that either you must accept a literalist interpretation of Genesis or be an atheist. Uh, that's not a position that I've ever held, and many, many, most Christians don't hold. But having said that, though, what's interesting about uh, Dawkins' lament is this. He criticizes, uh, he harshly criticizes Wise for embracing a religious belief that, why it, that results in Wise not treating himself and his talents, intelligence, and abilities in a way appropriate to their full flourishing. That is, given the opportunity to hone and nurture certain gifts, no one, including Wise, should waste them as a result of, of accepting a false belief. The person who violates or helps violate this norm, according to Dawkins, should be condemned and we should all bemoan the tragic moral neglect on the part of our fellows. But the issuing of, our, of that judgment on Wise by Dawkins makes sense only in light of Wise's particular talents and the sort of being Wise is by nature a being that Dawkins seems to believe possesses certain intrinsic capacities and purposes that if prematurely disrupted results in an injustice. So the human being who wastes his talents is one who does not respect his natural gifts or the basic capacities whose maturation and proper employment make possible the flourishing of many goods. Now you know where I'm going with this. What I'm suggesting here is that when, that, that when we talk, for example, as Catholics and Christians, that God created the universe and that there are final and formal causes in nature. We're not saying that these sorts of things can be detected through the instruments of the hard sciences. Uh, we, we, we don't believe, for example, you can look in a microscope and see the soul, right? Uh, we don't believe, for example, that uh, this is an example used by my friend Ed Fazer. He said, imagine somebody who, who owned a metal detector and it worked really well and you told him the mount was beautiful and he pulls out his metal detector and he says, well, it doesn't say it's beautiful, so I guess beauty doesn't exist, right? Uh, the, the simple fact that our instruments or our theories in the hard sciences are not uh, created to detect certain things doesn't mean those things aren't there. It, it's a particular different set of interests and ends. So what I'm suggesting here in my response to Dawkins is that when we talk, for example, of nature having intrinsic purposes, and that is evidence of, 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 of God as creator, we're not saying it's something you detect by the sciences, but something that we know and sometimes we can't not know. And I think this is precisely what Dawkins is doing here. Now there's other sorts of arguments, obviously, that I can bring up, but my point here is that when people like Sherry, Leiter, and Gay bring up unprovable, they, are, they have a narrow focus of what they mean by provabil uh, uh, provability, and they're ignoring the fact that there are many ways that one can argue for things without modeling it after the hard sciences. Um, incontestable, I'm gonna briefly mention this because I wanna give you guys a, a, some opportunity to ask questions. Um, uh, first off, the fact that um, that these critics often bring up the fact that religion is irrational shows that those beliefs are in fact contestable, right? You can't say that a belief is irrational unless you believe that it's something that can be contested, right? 
What they really mean is something like this, that the believer will still hold his beliefs even when there's contrary evidence. Now that's actually a character critique of the believer, but it has nothing to do with the beliefs. The beliefs can be t contested. Secondly, there are all sorts of secular beliefs that also appear to be incontestable. So let me give you just really one quick illustration. There's a view in the, in, in the area of the philosophy of mind called eliminative materialism. It's the belief that everything is material, including your mind, and that your beliefs are part of what these thinkers call folk psychology. There really are no beliefs. You don't really have beliefs. And you think, well, how would you actually disprove the belief that there aren't beliefs? <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's really a, di but if you're committed to fundamentally the view that everything is matter, and matter with no sort of form or finality to it. Um, what you do, what your theory does, it winds up excluding things that seem obvious to common sense, right? Now, I, I, I think that eliminative materialism is mistaken, but I'm leery to actually pronounce that it's irrational, right? Because I can counter uh, the eliminative materialist by saying, well, it seems to me that I have beliefs. In fact, there are aspects to my, my beliefs that have nothing to do with the material world. So if I have a belief that I'm holding a watch, the relationship between the belief and the watch is different than the relationship between my head and the watch. Right? The intentionality of my belief has a different relationship to the idea of watch than my head has to the actual watch. Right? This, is a, this is a physical relationship. The idea, relationship between the ideas is not physical. Right? But, but the limited materialists will have an answer for that. But the point is, all worldviews, to a certain extent, are stretched at their ends. And the fact that a particular point of view can be challenged, then a believer may have a response uh, that the unbeliever may not find satisfactory, doesn't mean that it's not contestable. <laughs> right? And then finally, um, uh, uh, the, the claim that um, secular, that the secular rationalist claims that um, uh, that re that that religion cannot change or develop is simply, and I document this in the book, is simply historically false. If you look at, for example, um, and I give four examples in 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 the book. One, uh, if you look at the development of Christian theology, the way in which uh, the church encounters Greek philosophy and is able to appropriate it in the development of doctrine. Right. Secondly, look at something like the different views of the nature of the embryo over time. The church had different views on this given uh, the influence of, uh, uh, of the hard sciences. Uh, third, the question of religious liberty. This is something that uh, uh, the church uh, issues uh, in, in, in Vatican II, right? That, that some people you know, were surprised by this, others not, and there, there were debates about whether this is uh, consistent with uh, what, what, what the church had said earlier and had some very good arguments that I agree with say yes it is consistent okay the point is that you find um, within uh, the history of Catholic and Christian thought a encounter with the secular world uh, in some cases an appropriation in some cases a rebuttal in some cases uh, a deeper understanding but the point is there are changes so that's simply historically false. Um, I have one more thing to say, but I, I'm gonna, I, I don't have time to be able to, uh, to, to say it. So let me just say uh, a few concluding remarks. Um, what I was arguing for here this morning was not that religion can't be irrational. There are, I believe, many irrational religious beliefs. And I'm not saying that the religious believer necessarily should uh, influence public policy um, in ways that the religious believer thinks is right. Uh, I think in some cases it's, it's a good thing, in some cases it's not, depending on the issue, the question, the culture, and so forth. But what I am suggesting, and what I'm arguing for, is that the separation of church and state should not be a proxy for the separation of faith and reason. And that's what I think it's, uh, it, it has become over the past 50 to 60 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.
after that, though, you're welcome. I have an incontestable claim, which is that we only have time for maybe a few questions. Okay. Uh, but Dr. Gwekko is very happy to, to take your questions. And if you don't get your question in here, he's eager to greet you at the reception afterwards, which is why we need to cut it off at a certain point. But if you do have a question, please feel free to come forward to the microphone at the front of the auditorium. Dr. Beckwith, thank you. I don't mean to the seminary. Oh. Uh, the U.S. bishops pushed forward the HHS mandate as a religious liberty claim. Are you suggesting that in the long run, that's a slippery strategy? Mm. Great, great question. I think, I think you have, no, I think in terms of the court, you have to make that claim. But I think you need a two-pronged sort of, str I'm sorry? I think you need a two-pronged strategy. I think in the court you have to offer the best and strongest legal arguments, and I think there, there are very strong legal arguments, uh, and I think that the, the attorneys that made those arguments did so wonderfully. On the other hand, though, I do think that there has to be a more public argument. That is, you have to actually start talking about why this is reasonable to believe, right? Why is it that the Catholic Church holds the views that it does? <laughs> Right? Most people don't, most Catholics don't know, right? So why should we expect people that are outside the church to know? So I do think you need a, a kind of two-pronged strategy there. There's actually an interesting uh, uh, exchange in the Hobby Lobby case that, that I think brings this out. And this is actually what I was going to talk about in the last section. Uh, Justice um, Alito, in his majority opinion, rightfully mentions that this is a, a religious matter and they're not going to, and he says, we're not going to delve into whether it's reasonable or not. Uh, the counter argument by Justice uh, Ginsburg is, well, what about like the Jehovah's Witness that, you know, doesn't want to have the blood transfusion or, 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 let's, say the, or let's say the physician uh, doesn't want to perform the blood transfusion or the business owner doesn't want to provide, you know, in the healthcare transfusion or the Christian scientist who believes that you're really not sick at all. Right? Or, and she brings up other, uh, other groups that have prohibitions against eating of pork and that certain forms of, I guess, pills are made out of uh, gelatin that's made out of pigs or whatever. She brings up all these things. And, and I raise this in the book. I, I, I think there's a good response to it legally. And, and uh, the, the response by Alito is, well, you know, in RIFRA, uh, there's a compelling state interest standard. That is, uh, you know, if the state has a compelling interest, uh, then you can override the interest of of the, of the business owner. But at the end of the day, I think compelling interest standard is driven by cultural assumptions about what's reasonable. So the reason why we think that the Jehovah's Witness and the Christian scientists are wrong is, I mean, I think for, for someone like Ginsburg, or at least not for her, but maybe for other justices, is that we actually don't know any people who, I mean, and we think it's kind of a crazy belief, right? We think it's unscientific and theologically weird. Right? Uh, but that's what they think about our beliefs. Right? And the only reason why ours survive is because there's lots of us. <laughs> right? And people actually know Catholics who believe these things. Right? I, I actually, so what I'm saying is that anytime, and you find this often in Supreme Court opinions, justices will offer a procedural guideline that actually presupposes substantive content. Compelling state interest only makes sense if the state has an interest that's compelling. Well, how do you figure that out? I mean, what if, what if um, the government were just to assert, we have a compelling interest in male-female marriage, period, and we're not gonna give a reason. Do you think the court's gonna accept that? No, they're gonna accept, they're gonna have to what? The, 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 the legislature's gonna have to offer some kind of reasons, right? So I think at the end of the day, to get back to your question, I think the legal arguments have to be made, but ultimately the legal arguments and their strength depend ultimately on the plausibility of the, of the beliefs. There's a, there's a famous case um, uh, involving um, the building of a freeway, I think through the state of Washington, um, involving a Native American burial ground. And uh, the court ultimately says, there's just no way that the government could build this freeway without in any, some way trampling upon this burial ground. And, so there's no other way, it's just, sorry Indians, that's just too bad, right? Um, 
Stephen Carter at Yale Law School in an, an article about that case says, they would never mow down St. John the Divine in Manhattan for a freeway. And his point is that there is, it's because we know Episcopalians, right? I mean, I, I think that has a lot to do with it, so. I hope this doesn't sound uh, sectarian, but you're a Catholic at yeah. Baylor, so you can probably handle yeah. it. But how much of the um, bias of secular rationalists against religion has to do with the bias that the Protestants, uh, Protestant Reformation has had against reason? And, and some of the appeals and, and frankly, behavior of various sects uh, within the culture. I, I would imagine that uh, the legal theorists that you cited there, when they're thinking of religion, they're not thinking of Thomas Aquinas as Summa, they're probably thinking of snake handlers in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Good question. You know, I don't know if you, any of you have read Brad Gregory's book, The Unintended Reformation, uh, but he's a historian and philosopher at Notre Dame, and it, he's, he makes the case that um, the way in which the Protestant reformers thought of the relationship between faith and reason is ultimately the reason why we have secularism today. I, I find Gre Gregory's um, thesis compelling. Uh, I, think, I think he's right. Uh, but I do think, um, the, I think a kind of, um, uh, sola scriptura mentality feeds into this secular rationalism. So, um, in fact, I, I wrote a piece a, a couple of years ago for the Catholic Thing, which is an online magazine, called Sola Scriptura Secularism. And, and so you'll find, for example, um, uh, secularists talking, about, uh, let's say, uh, like on the issue of uh, any sort of, uh, the issue of abortion. Uh, I think Newsweek, every, 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 week, every couple of years, you know, has an issue of their magazine intended for to fully offend uh, Christians of one sort or another. But I think it had to do with abortion, and they said, you know, the Bible never forbids abortion. Well, that that's true, but the Bible doesn't forbid necrophilia either, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so the assumption behind the critique is that, right, the only Christians around are those that simply treat Scripture as if it's a kind of systematic theology textbook with riddles in it. Right? And that, I do think that feeds into that, you know. Um, so it does put, uh, it does put, um, you know, Protestants in a very difficult position. I have a evangelical dear friends, uh, as many of my friends are still uh, evangelicals and uh, remain my friends after I return to the church. And one of the things I find interesting among them is a, is, is a, is a conscious appropriation of thinkers like Aquinas. Uh, partly because they want to be able to present their views in the public square by not simply citing scripture. And they understand, I think they have a appreci greater appreciation for that. Um, yes, Father. Father Brian Harrison of the Overlates of Wisdom Studies Center. Uh, several years ago, Time Magazine issued a very interesting story giving the results of an, a, poll, a poll between um, people of different religious traditions in the United States with their response to the question or to the affirmation whether they agree, disagree and so on America is a religious country and this religious tradition should be reflected in our public legislation and the results were very interesting something like 75 to 80 percent of evangelical Protestants answered agree or strongly agree Catholics and mainstream traditional Protestants around about 50, below 50 percent. Interesting. The lowest group were Jewish uh, respondents with about 25 percent. Now my question is, it seems that given the very strong, let's say, Baptist evangelical tradition, really strong separation of church and state, is this surprising that so many evangelicals uh, answered positively to that question, whereas, say, Catholics, we have a long tradition of the social kingship of Christ did yeah. not. Any comment on that? Interesting. That's a, that's a, I have a theory on that. Um, and it, it has to do with the fact that most evangelical Protestants um, think of, they, they have a close connection between sort of American civil society and their faith. Now, they, don't, they believe in the separation of church and state. They don't believe the, the institutional church and the institutional state 
should have any sort of control over each other. But there's a sense that they connect their, their, their view of civil society with the flourishing of churches independently from the state and so forth. Um, this comes out in, there's a book that a couple years ago was published by uh, Phil Hamburger at Columbia Law School. It's called Separation of Church and State. And it's a, it's a kind of a history of, uh, of, of how we got sort of contemporary church state uh, jurisprudence. And he makes the point that the early separationists were, were anti-Catholic, but they believed in a Protestant American hegemony. And it gets co-opted in the early 20th century by secularists. And those same Protestants go, uh-oh, we didn't mean it that way. <laughs> and so I do think the shift, I, I think that's why you get those statistics. To, you see it in, in this. I, I, when I was first hired at Baylor, I was hired in the Institute for Church State Studies, which is named after James Martin Dawson, or J.M. Dawson, who was the founder of Protestants and Others United for the Separation of Church and State, which is now called Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. When I was in the, we, 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 I was there when um, we, we, we were putting things from online, or, or from all these old files, to uh, turning them into PDFs and putting them online, and, 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 and while, while going through them, I found a file of literature published for the 1960 election responding to Kennedy's candidacy. And it was, they were a lot of, it, it was published by evangelicals, Baptists, about how if you elect a Catholic president, the Pope is gonna run the United States, you know, through uh, the White House and, and all this. And, and this was right around the 2004 election, right? So as we're going through this, and it occurs to me that how things have changed. In 1960, American evangelicals were afraid that the Catholic candidate for the presidency would listen to the Pope. And then in 2004, American evangelicals were afraid that the Catholic candidate for the presidency wouldn't listen to the Pope. And it, it's, it's astonishing. And I think, I think what happened is that when you live in a largely Christian culture where the issues that are contested today are sort of the fabric and background beliefs that everyone accepts. It accentuates the differences. But now that those issues are contested, the realization on the part of most evangelicals is that this, there isn't a Protestant hegemony anymore. So I think that's what account, accounts for it. I, as far as why I think mainline Protestants and Catholics have shifted to the more traditional separationist, I think it has to do with upward mobility in education, that the realization that in order to be, in order to commiserate with the elites, you have to accept much of what they believe about the secular religious distinction. So that's, and this is just my sort of armchair or podium pontification. So, um, is that it? Anybody wanna? All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A great thank you, Dr. Beckwith. It's been such a pleasure to have you with us and to, to hear your words this morning. Uh, before we conclude with a uh, closing prayer from Father Horn, I just have a couple housekeeping items. One is you're all very much welcome at a reception that is prepared just across the hall when you exit the auditorium in the Lally Room, and Dr. Beckwith will be there and will be happy to, to greet you there. And secondly, as you leave, a couple of our seminarians uh, will be uh, there with baskets if you'd like to offer an offering today to help us support uh, our efforts to continue this lecture and, and other things like it. Please feel free, but uh, don't feel obligated. It's simply a free will offering if you're able to help us support uh, these kinds of, of works on behalf of, of the seminary and offer them to the public. So with that, I'll invite Father John Horn, our President Rector, to offer some concluding remarks. Uh, Dr. Beckwith, I'll be very brief. We're, we're so grateful for your presence, your presentation, blessing us with a, a rich understanding to encourage us all the more to uh, understand in our studies how reason informs faith and faith informs reason, and not only how compatible they are, but how necessary it is for us to have a a just society. Um, I would say my uh, 
make a little confession here. My favorite course in theological studies was church-state relations. Um, some would find that strange, but uh, it was on John Courtney Murray and the debates in Vatican II. Um, but so uh, there's a special need, of course, uh, in our day, uh, and I hope that the people who are enjoying conversation with you afterwards around Hobby Lobby and other cases can receive an even richer blessing of this special need to, to understand how faith and reason serve a just society. John Courtney Murray did talk about uh, the church, the Catholic Church in particular, being the only church that could and does, uh, in and through the sovereignty of Jesus, critique the state, um, not because it's uh, the church not being a sect, but use the image of Peter's net, St. Peter's net, being cast over the entire world. Um, that was quite porous, but through natural law and through argumentation and that we've received this morning from Dr. Beckwith, draws through attraction, uh, critiques uh, states morally, and uh, draws them into the, uh, the beauty of the, the creation of Jesus, the ongoing uh, creative love of Jesus. So I'd like to offer a simple blessing. Um, when you see uh, the movie Selma, by the way, um, perhaps in some very basic and fundamental way, many, many of uh, the points that Dr. Beckwith will address us with, uh, <laughs> there's a quite clear evidence in our own lifetime uh, of how faith and reason brought about a more just society and uh, through voting rights laws and, and others. Uh, civil rights law in the mid-60s. Uh, it's a very inspiring movie that can practically bring home some of the points this morning. So the blessing I offer is both reasonable and filled with faith. Uh, it's reasonable because we need it as creatures and uh, it's filled with faith because it's God's desire to continue to bless us and to draw us into the heart of the Trinity. Let's pause for a few seconds of silence and call to mind the Trinity's desire to bless us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the laws of nature, for the gift of reason, for the gift of faith that brings us, that serves us, to bring us into your wisdom. Enkindle the gift of wisdom within our hearts all the more Bless Dr. Beckwith's work and research in the days ahead all the more. We thank you and we abandon ourselves to you so that we might be all the more yours. Bring your blessing down upon this assembly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's enjoy more conversation with Dr. Beckwith. Thank you.